So, um, let me read a little bit about uh, Simon Riggs. And uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited to have him here. Let me read his description, his job description from LinkedIn. So, uh, CTO of Second Quadrant. Thank you for sponsoring it also the event. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, go ahead. Um, uh, Postgres measure developer and committeer. How many of you is using Postgres with, together with Alfresco? Okay, same. <laughs> I guess that was the MySQL guys that left. <laughs> uh, probably the mic is not working. Let me check. And uh, uh, I also I also see written the title that uh, is the author of PostgreSQL nine admin cookbook. So probably. This could be an interesting talk. Thank you, Simon. We are excited to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, I write Postgres, and um, I'm here to talk to you guys because you use Postgres, and uh, together we uh, form quite a, an awesome combination. So what I'm going to do is uh, talk about the things I know about. Um, I've got half an hour, right? But I'm here for three days. So really what I'm trying to do here is tell you a little bit about what I know uh, and then ask you to come and talk to me afterwards uh, so that we can engage in some more detailed discussion because in, in half an hour it's pretty difficult to get into some of these details. And um, good start. I've forgotten to plug in the... Uh... Good, good. Right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about a range of different topics, all associated with Alfresco and Postgres. Um, hopefully all of interest to you. Uh, my inspiration for being here is that uh, large organisations have got very complex problems. Uh, I used to be an enterprise architect some uh, years ago, uh, looking at thousands of different applications for various purposes, uh, many different types and categories of applications. Uh, and the, uh, the reality is that uh, nobody's just using Alfresco, they're using loads of other things. I don't mean content management systems, I mean all different types of application. Um, and uh, hopefully people are using uh, uh, Alfresco with PostgreSQL, which it seems is, is true. Um, so the synergy between the two things from my perspective is that they're both open source uh, content platforms of various kinds. Um, so, you know, we're not always talking about document stores. But there's many different types of data out there in the, in the real world where we're having to cope with different types of application. But what is interesting is that frequently uh, the, uh, the different data stores are all operated by roughly the same people. Um, and that gives some appreciation amongst all of you about that the different challenges involved in the different types of data. Uh, so my question really as a, as a general question is, how can we make them work better together? Uh, and that is something that I'd like to go into with you over the next couple of days. Um, but also, where else can we use Alfresco? Where else can we use Postgres? And where else can we use open source? So those are the things I'm thinking about and why I've come here to talk to you, but also to listen to you over the next couple of days. So um, I uh, uh, spoke to Thomas about uh, the existence of the Alfresco reference architecture, um, and that explains um, the, the different relationships of the components of Alfresco. Uh, but the reference architecture uh, does mention uh, that a database is required, but if you look at it, it says uh, the database server can represent a single point of failure, so you should have suitable failover systems in place. Uh, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, configuration of advanced database features is vendor dependent and is out of scope of this document. So it's a reference architecture, but it's actually referencing some other vendor's uh, configuration documents. Uh, now in this case, Second Quadrant is the vendor. We're a, a primary sponsor, primary contributor to PostgreSQL. Uh, and we, one of the things we do is make the uh, robustness and resilience systems uh, effective, 
and we've been doing that for more than 12 years. So one of the things that we offer in this regard is a, a deployment blueprint for our Fresco, uh, and we also offer a load of different services. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on that because I know you're open source people and you probably want to do all of that yourself. So what I am going to talk about is uh, performance, uh, robustness and replication. Um, so I've got some performance results here, um, really uh, derived by Boris um, you know, with some understanding of, of Postgres. Um, these are based on a number of different workloads. Uh, and we've also used a couple of different versions of Postgres uh, to get the results out. So uh, just looking at Alfresco read performance, uh, you'll see that the blue is out-of-the-box performance. So I should mention that we're using Community Edition 5.2.f here, um, because uh, this is pretty cool. Um, the performance that we've got shows, it, uh, if you have a look at the blue, um, this is one, two, and four sessions, uh, and you'll see that there's a, a slight regression there going from two to four sessions. So what we're observing straight off is that a little bit of tuning will go quite a long way with Postgres. Um, and then we also observe that uh, uh, with uh, out of the box, we're going to climb quite significantly um, based upon first some tuning, and second, upgrading the Postgres release to a, a, a later release, which is more highly performant. So what uh, I've then done is uh, compare all of these different performance measurements together on the three different workloads we tested. One is uh, a write mix, which is uh, creating users. Um, and then uh, there's the read test, and then there's the mix, which is a whole range of different things. Um, and in all cases, you can see that um, tuning is going to benefit you uh, quite significantly. It's roughly going to double the performance uh, on uh, the system. Uh, and the important thing to note there is that uh, we're not doing anything at all to Alfresco. We're just simply tuning Postgres. Okay. So this isn't better hardware or anything, it's just simple tuning actions on PostgreSQL itself. Uh, and then of course uh, you can see uh, that we've been doing our jobs correctly because the performance goes up from release to release. And that is something that we've been doing with Postgres for many years now. In fact, uh, since I started the project, uh, the server's about 200 times faster um, I'd love to claim that that was all me, uh, but unfortunately not, but um, uh, that's over more than a dozen years. If you put Postgres on a multi-CPU server and run the same benchmark at different versions, we're, we're 200 times faster, or more than 200 times faster. So we pay a lot of attention to uh, speeding up both read-only and mixed concurrent workloads. And that's available for you to benefit from, and that's really what this is a, a demonstration of. Um, <coughs> now, exactly what the workload is obviously varies. Uh, the types of tuning that you can perform uh, will vary from workload to workload. So uh, I'm interested to hear from you uh, exactly what your workloads are and, and how we could help. Uh, so the next thing to talk about is backup. Uh, obviously. Um, Alfresco themselves have identified uh, a single database as a single point of failure, so we're expecting it to fail at some point. We also know that our content is important, so we need to back it up. Uh, and back it up more than once, um, because backups always go bad. So uh, the backup sequence is uh, to, first of all, back up uh, Postgres itself then back up the content store, and uh, because we're using external indexing uh, to actually take up a, a backup from uh, further back in time so that we can roll the uh, indexes forward to uh, the latest version of the data. And now Postgres does offer you the ability to uh, recover to a specific point in time. So if there's uh, a major change or disaster happens in your content store, 
as is easily possible, uh, then we can recover that to a point in time or even to a specific transaction. So when you're trying to line up different data across different data stores, it's very useful to be able to uh, recover things to an exact point in time. Uh, the other point to mention is that the, the Postgres backup is fully online. Uh, there's multiple different kinds of backup, uh, and all of them allow you to access uh, the database while it's online, fully usable. Um, now, in the, uh, the implication of what I've written there is that you're doing a daily backup, uh, but of course what you could also do is uh, a more frequent backup. Now, one of the things that um, uh, we often mistake is that um, uh, uh, if you do something called a PG dump on a Postgres database, it does not offer you the opportunity to do uh, point-in-time recovery. It's a snapshot backup. So if you do your backup nightly using that technique and you crash, you're going to lose a whole day of work. Uh, and that's why we offer uh, much more fine-grained backup mechanisms uh, and replication using the same transaction log facilities because it's possible to set this up in a way that you don't lose a transaction at all in the case of a crash, which I'm sure you uh, think is quite important. Um, one of the things to mention about the, uh, the backup, though, is uh, the use of solar indexes uh, themselves is uh, something that, uh, although it's uh, the standard way at the moment, it doesn't always need to be that way. Um, the, uh, the, the currently supported version of Postgres with uh, 5.2f is 944. Uh, that's 9.4.4. Now, for me, uh, that was published in 20, um, uh, 2014. So at this point, that release is two and a half years out of date. Now, if you're used to using Oracle, two and a half years is nothing, right? That, that was the last release of Oracle. But with Postgres, we release a new version every single year. Uh, so at this point, 9.4 uh, 9 is two major versions behind uh, what we think of as production. We just closed uh, the freeze window on version 10. Uh, so in September, uh, that number will climb to three whole major versions uh, behind where Postgres thinks is the right place to be. Uh, now, some people think that that uh, gives you stability, but the reality is that a lot of the bugs can't be fixed in uh, back branches, and uh, the best way to do things is to actually use uh, a later version. So I hope the performance numbers I've shown you uh, encourage you to move to the later versions as, as soon as possible. But um, just talking about the, uh, the solar indexes really reminds me uh, to mention some of the other capabilities. I think somebody came up to me and said, what's the Postgres roadmap? We go, OK, well, in what area? Um, because we produce literally hundreds of different features in every release. Um, and uh, the, for example, version 10 looks like it's going to have about 500 new features. Now, some of those are small, some are big. Uh, which ones do you want to know about? Um, that's the difficulty. So Postgres supports both relational, which is what people say Postgres is a relational database. But it, interestingly, it never was just a relational database. The whole reason for Postgres, the whole name of Postgres, is it was built by the guy that did Ingres. And he wanted something beyond relational, so he called it postgres. Okay, he wanted post-relational. So for 30 years it's been post-relational. Okay, so it's not just a relational database, and never was. Um, so we support JSON, XML, uh, and text capabilities uh, directly in the database. And uh, there's quite a wide range of full text capabilities in there. Um, trigram similarity indexes, regexes, uh, wildcards, phrase search. Um, and just to make the point that this is fully real-time indexing, not near real-time indexing. 
Um, and there's multiple different types of index. Postgres has got more indexes than any other data store. Um, and th that's, that's just the index types out of the box. Uh, the index uh, mechanism is actually extensible and you can write your own indexes as well. So just a couple of uh, other capabilities in there. Online upgrade, concurrent index build, parallel query, partitioning. These are all things that um, would be of great interest to you, um, I think, uh, I hope. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to talk about how we might use those. So what I wanted to do was just give you an overview of how the replication works, just so that you can understand how to remove the single points of failure. Um, so uh, Postgres uh, produces streaming replication, which means it does very low, to, low latency links to a second, what we call a standby node. Now you can do that asynchronously across regions, or you can do it synchronously within a region. On top of that, uh, you can actually uh, set these things up in a way that cascades from one <coughs> to the other as a way of uh, uh, minimizing bandwidth. But you can also run queries against the uh, standby nodes, so you can actually access that data in multiple different ways. Now, one of the ways that uh, you might want to think about using that is with something like uh, Alphalytics, where you can actually access the data on the standby node um, and then push reports back to uh, the metadata on the, uh, the master node. Uh, that's one of the approaches that you might use. Now that's available uh, now. One of the newer technologies that we're moving to is something called logical replication, which allows you to replicate between masters, where you replicate just the data involved. Uh, and actually, if you use logical replication for that, it would work uh, quite a lot better as well. Uh, so the idea there is that you're running the analytics on the uh, secondary nodes as a way of offloading uh, the main database, uh, if that's particularly high volume. <coughs> so uh, I'm just going to give you a couple of minute tour of some of the other options that we've got with Postgres, because these are the kind of questions that we tend to get all of the time. Does it support this? Does it support that? Um, so uh, real-time selective replication using a tool called PG Logical. We've got multi-master Postgres, and we've also got massively distributed Postgres as well. So uh, if I do that in pictures, um, the idea of PG Logical is you can take data out of your <coughs> systems and uh, send them through to other nodes. And we can do this with uh, database technology. So we don't need ETL tools to push data around in batches. We can actually pump it in direct real time from system to system. So you can set up straight through processing systems. Um, now, this is how we get data uh, between systems. Uh, the, um, because of the proliferation of applications in the, in the modern enterprise, we end up with systems very frequently have extracts of data from one system to another. And it's quite rare to see a system that is just a standalone system. So the content that you're uh, managing within our fresco is almost certainly going to be pumped out of there into other systems uh, and potentially data pumped into Alfresco systems from other places. Uh, and that's uh, the kind of uh, idea of how we do that. Now, the, uh, the, the concept here really is that uh, Postgres is your transactional or operational system of choice. Uh, and so this is the bit where people say, um, but we don't just use Postgres, we also use other systems as well. It's, that's fine, that's perfectly fine. Somebody asked me a question about uh, MySQL and were, uh, were we challenged when Oracle took over MySQL? Uh, I'd just like to say no, not at all. 
the phone rang uh, all day long that day uh, with people um, wanting to move away from my sequel. So that was a great day for us. Um, and uh, really, there's a lot of interest now in Postgres. Uh, Amazon have uh, come out and said that uh, uh, Postgres is their uh, fastest growing business unit within Amazon. Um, and Postgres usage is really exploding worldwide now. Um, um, John this morning mentioned uh, FINRA, who are using Postgres, um, open source Postgres, and he also mentioned Cap One, uh, or Capital One, um, who are using PostgreSQL, uh, and they're a second quadrant customer. Uh, we're putting things together for them. But they, um, they've taken a decision uh, about 18 months ago to make all of their new operational systems run on Postgres. All of them. Okay? So it's a total database strategy change over to Postgres. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, because it's not just about custom apps, it's also about um, um, sort of packaged applications or um, sort of related technology. <coughs> So one of the things that uh, we can do with this technology is, for example, uh, pump uh, data out to uh, edge nodes. Um, the content managed within our Fresco is seldom just stored in our, or used in our Fresco. It's going to be pumped out to various places in the organization. Uh, and we can do that directly uh, with the real-time data pumping. Uh, but one of the other uh, things that we can do is uh, multi-master uh, technology uh, because in, in quite a few situations you'll see where uh, the Postgres database is only exists as a single master it's quite painful uh, to run uh, a content store application remotely uh, where you've got uh, significant um, latency uh, between it yeah, and this is this is latency between east and west coast. You imagine what that's like between uh, Europe and Australia or uh, Europe and, and the US even. So what, uh, what we've developed is something called BDR, which is bi-directional replication. And the idea there is that uh, you're able to run this um, multi-master uh, fashion, which means you can write anything to any copy of the database and it syncs up automatically with all of the other copies. Now, uh, obviously, you're going to say, well, that, that can cause conflicts in some situations. And you're absolutely right. Uh, but in most cases, um, <coughs> the applications are designed in a way that that won't happen. Uh, and particularly uh, with uh, lower volume applications like uh, uh, content management, Actually, it works really nicely, uh, so you can have people uh, editing um, the uh, content in Asia Pacific, and then they can be editing it in the US at the same time. Um, so it makes it really nice. Now, if you're if you're running a worldwide operation where your content team in Kuala Lumpur uh, are developing things uh, for you, I mean they're typically going to be eight hours ahead, and uh, as a result. Is, is not likely to be any conflict. Um, so we're using this technology for, for quite a lot of production systems. Uh, the, uh, the normal thing that people also ask is, uh, does it run in distributed fashion? Uh, does it scale? And uh, yes, we have a scalable version of Postgres. It's not Postgres core yet, um, but I should add that all of the things I'm describing here fully open source. Okay, I'm not uh, describing proprietary technologies. These are all open source contributions and fully managed projects. So what this does is um, allow you to run a database across a cluster of data nodes and as a result scale a database up into tens of terabytes <coughs> and beyond. Um, so this provides business intelligence and LLTP. So if you've got a, a, a document store, this looks very similar in some respects to a 
NoSQL database. You can actually run larger queries on it as well. So, so quite, a, quite a different range of capabilities there. Um, so back to this synergy idea. Um, I see Alfresco as, uh, as related. They're not uh, um, kind of overlapping, uh, but Alfresco runs on Postgres, uh, but Postgres can also cope with a, a range of other types of, uh, of data. So please write to me or come and talk to me. Um, I don't know anyone here, right? So unless you already know me, but uh, I don't think that's the case. So um, I'm probably going to be standing on my own looking uh, hopeful that you'll come and talk to me. So please, please do come and say hello. Tell us what you're using it for. You know, just tell me how you're using Postgres and, uh, and I'll see if I can make um, some sense of that and see if I can help uh, with things. So uh, we are an open source company. Um, my uh, closing comments are to say that there are multiple vendors in the Postgres ecosystem, uh, but we're the people that are pushing the open source version forwards, and we've put together a sustainable open source company uh, that operates worldwide. Uh, so we're, um, we've just set up in Australia. We've obviously been going quite a while in in the US um, and uh, we provide support for, for a wide range of large enterprises um, doing kind of the normal stuff, training, consulting, that kind of thing. Um, so just to emphasize that we are sustainable open source. So all of this is being funded by users and we're not actually venture capital funded. Um, we're funded by the people that use Postgres, uh, and that's what's funding us to be able to put more than four man years per year uh, back into core Postgres, um, which is uh, what we spend quite a bit of time doing. So, um, got a couple of minutes left for questions, uh, but I'm aware that uh, I've only really given you a very small amount of information about uh, uh, Postgres. <laughs> today, so I would very welcome um, some deeper conversations. Uh, all questions now? Uh, oh, thanks for your, for your talk, because we are using Alfresco and we are using also Postgres every day, but we have no yeah. idea about Postgres, it's just another box on our system. Yeah. Um, we, last year we were uh, migrating uh, three Oracle database to PostgreSQL yes. because uh, of, the, uh, of the client they are asking to move from Oracle to, uh, to Postgres. And we were using uh, that uh, ORA2 to, uh, to PG tool. I don't know if this is the best approach as a Postgres newbie <laughs> or not. Um, yeah, it, it, it's typically more complex than just that, um, but it depends how, you know, where it is on the complexity scale, really. So, they're, they're, you know, mo most of the open source tools work to a certain extent. And then after that, it requires you know, typically some manual intervention. But um, we've uh, certainly improved the Oracle compatibility over the years. Um, so there's, there's not that many things that it doesn't do just directly now. So um, improved it a lot. So. Other questions? Of course. So I know that second part and a half people that is uh, Spanish speaking. Um, so the training, is it also in Spanish that you guys give? Uh, yeah, it can be. Um, <laughs> um, well, we obviously we do English and Spanish. Um, so uh, we've got a big Italian community and uh, guys, um, guys in Czechia and various other places. So it uh, depends what you need. We do do... Uh, Spanish speaking 24 7 support for Postgres as well. So we, we really are a global company. Um, so um, most of the Spanish speaking people are actually based in South America. Um, but um, you know, we're, we're based all over the world. Um, so 
our policy has been really to uh, to work with the open source community directly. Um, so a lot of the people that work for us are open source contributors, uh, and as a result, we we hired them from wherever they are in the world, not uh, only hiring people near wherever you think I come from. No. Okay, well, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak here. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, meet new faces, so please come and have a chat. Thank you very much, Simon. I think that uh, Simon during the role during the pause is not his fault, but probably we have we have some <laughs> things to... I, I have lots of questions for you, but we will Good. ask him later. Thank you again, Simon. With uh, Brecht and then Beth and Double Talk.